First of all, I'm going to just say something a little bit about the, the title slide. Any of you who've taken part in a referendum will know that it's, it's interesting because it's a vote that's given over to the entire public or the entire voting public rather than a decision that's kept in the hands of a small number of elected representatives. And the reason I've called my talk demagoguery, hard to say, or democracy in action, is that demagoguery, or some definitions of that phrase, kind of um, summon up uh, a, a sort of a, a political agitator or, or a leader that relies purely on dr drumming up strong, strong emotions, even kind of mob rule, if you like, as opposed to a more reasoned deliberation. And what I wanted to explore in about just 10 minutes, I think it, it'll be, is, is that idea of what a referendum is in our democracy, uh, the place of emotion in it and the place of reasoned deliberation and, and whether they can be a force for good or a force for ill in our democracy. Well, our journey today begins in Scotland, in Glasgow. I don't know if we've got any Glaswegians here, but several months before the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, I was in Glasgow, and I guess it was a time, this was several months before the referendum, but already the world's eyes were on Scotland, thinking, is this country going to become an independent country? or is it going to choose to stay part of the UK? And that the Electoral Reform Society, which is the organisation that I, I run, an organisation that's trying to bring about a more healthy democracy in the United Kingdom, we wanted to get underneath the stay, leave decision that Scots were being asked to make, and we wanted to explore a little bit more deeply about democratic participation. So you've got some lovely images there of, of just how seriously the Scots took the vote and how sort of energetically they got involved. But the group that we brought together, we asked a company to help us bring some, some groups together, had one thing in common, and this was their lack of democratic participation. These were people who never vote, ever. No matter what the issue, no matter what the election, no matter if a candidate's bothered to knock on their door, they never vote. Some of them had voted, some of the older people had voted in the past and then they'd given up, couldn't see the point of it, and most of the younger people had never voted at all. And my colleague, Willie Sullivan, who's the director of the Electoral Reform Society in Scotland, calls these people the missing millions, and he's written a book about it, which, which you, you might want to go away and read. Uh, what I wanted to tell you about this group of people is that we basically just, it was quite a small group, and we just went round the table and we said, so, so you're, you, know, you, you don't ever seem to vote, but what about this Scottish independence referendum? What about this? Are you going to vote? Every single person said they were going to vote. Why? It's the future of my country. And so in this, they had found something of meaning, something that was worthwhile, and that was why they wanted to have their say. And then on polling day, when 97% of the Scots, the Scottish people were registered to vote and 85% turned out. I think we really saw the sign of, of the truth of, of, that those groups had told. This was a decision that was worth being part of. It, it was a really something they felt almost magnificently important and, and that it was worth their time, it was worth their while. There was something extraordinary about the, the length and the breadth of the participation that you saw in the Scottish referendum. It really showed what a referendum can do, that it will energise people with those huge numbers. And there was something about the length of time that people had there, which I'll touch on as well for, for the debate. So that was, that was a kind of a, an extraordinary example, if you like, of the kind of le length and breadth and depth of political participation that can happen in a country. Well, fast forward a couple of years to this summer and the 23rd of June, and Britons voted 52% to 48% to leave the European Union. Well, I was back uh, in my local gym uh, that, the weekend after the vote, and I hadn't been there for some time because it had been an intensely busy time at work. And at my local gym, it's very unusual to overhear much political chat. 
uh, maybe the sort of heavy breathing and the hot FM, don't know, uh, the kind of the, the, the loud sounds in the gym, or um, it might just be that there's not that much uh, chat going on. And in fact, the last time I'd had any kind of a political conversation at the gym had been a couple of days after the general election in early May in 2015, and I was lying on a mat uh, doing my warm-up exercises, and a neighbour of mine and uh, her friend uh, came over and they'd spotted me on television talking about the five million people who voted for the United Kingdom Independence Party and the Green Party at the general election and had only ended up with one member of parliament apiece. Um, for, for all those votes that had, all, uh, had been all the representation it had added up to. Anyway, they'd heard about that and they wanted to talk to me about it. But this time round, there were three men, probably in their 20s, I would guess, and they were having an incredibly energetic uh, talk about the EU vote. So this was a couple of days after the, the referendum when we decided as a country to leave the European Union. Um, and they were using extremely colourful language that I won't repeat today, uh, but they were saying uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, um, Norway, that's never going to work here, uh, and so on. And they were demonstrating a concrete and detailed grasp of the issues underlying that important vote. And then they uh, politely stepped aside to let me get to the weights machine, and then they carried on with their debate about the EU. Well, this really got me thinking about what is it that brings politics into the mainstream, to the cafes, to the gyms, to the bus stops? What is it that, that brings us to that political table, if you like, or brings politics into our lives, into the places where we spend our lives? And I was struck by, for me, one of the, the symbols of the, or the pictures I have in my mind when I think about the Scottish independence referendum, which was the women who were on a hen night discussing the future of the currency in Scotland should Scotland decide to become an independent country. And for me, this has become one of the symbols of the extent of the democratic participation that took place in Scotland. People seized the agenda for themselves. They became knowledgeable. Uh, they took the agenda, if you like, from the formal campaigns and from the elites, and they made it something for them. And they dissected the issues, and they talked about the issues for themselves. So done well, I would argue that a referendum, a public vote that's thrown open to every single one of us on the register to take part on, can cut through to people and get into the heart of their lives. Even in this cynical era, if the topic is right, a referendum can get an issue out there and it can be something that people really grapple with. And of course, in a referendum, in a vote that is thrown open to all of us, every single vote counts. I don't know if any of you here were part of the surge in membership that some political parties um, found happened after the EU referendum. Uh, some of you might have even joined, joined parties or, or rejoined parties, I don't know. But at the Electoral Reform Society, at my, my independent non-governmental organisation, we had our own mini surge in membership and hundreds of people contacted us why were they joining the Electoral Reform Society? They said, my vote has just counted in the referendum. It didn't matter where I lived in the country. My vote had the same value as, as someone else's vote. There were no safe seats, seats that always go to the same party. As they say, you pin a rosette on a donkey and the same party gets in however you have cast your vote. There was none of that. There were no postcode lotteries. Wherever you were in the country, your vote was of equal value. And so many more people have joined our society and our cause because they want a voting system that can give equal value and equal voice. Now, the result was of the EU vote, the, the, the vote to leave the European Union, was clear and it was decisive, but many of us felt dissatisfied. And many people on both sides of the debate felt dissatisfied about the, the quality of the debate and the, the, the information. We wanted to take a closer look at that and understand that. Why was it that with a really quite a good turnout, 72% more than in the general election, the parliamentary election, why was it that we felt 
so dissatisfied. And so many people, after the four months, quite four quite intense months of, a, of the formal campaign, just felt that the quality of the information in the public debate wasn't good enough, and it didn't match up to the interests that people had. Well, we took um, a closer look at this, and uh, my colleague Will um, has collated the information, and it was a real team effort. And we, we just tried to do some dissection. We tried to get under to get understand to understand that dissatisfaction a little bit more. We had conducted surveys throughout the campaign that really looked at how people were feeling. What was their actual experience? Not just what we were being told by the campaigns, but what were the information sources they were using? Who were they trusting or not trusting? How were they feeling about the experience? And what we discovered was that time really matters. It's, it's an incredible experience today. Here we all are taking the time to hear from some quite extraordinary and witness some extraordinary people and interact with each other. And, and, and that's a wonderful experience. And journalists in this campaign were bored before the referendum campaign had even started. But for the general public, for all of us, we needed time and we didn't have it. We needed the time and the space to really dissect and get to grips with the issues for ourselves. Let's just look at this, this spike. That's the 24th of June. That's Friday. That po polling day, uh, as we probably appreciate, is, is Thursday in this country. This was on Friday. The frequency of the phrase, what is the EU, Googled in the UK. People, th this was a high interest but low information referendum. People were really interested. Don't let anybody tell you that people in this country were not interested. They had a high level of interest. So uh, it, it was as though people didn't get the, the richness of information, the time and space to breathe and to deliberate that their interest really mattered. They didn't get the campaign that they deserved. What's the solution? Well, the first thing we have to do is to understand what kind of a creature referendums are. In a typically British style, we've tacked referendums, public votes that are thrown open for a direct say by anybody who wants to get on the register and have that say, to a fairly traditional representative democracy, a democracy that is evolving and bringing in more participation and deliberation. We need to think before we have any more referendums about how, what sort of a creature this is and how does it knit in with other elements of our democracy. Don't let's wait until after the vote to then consider how does Parliament's role reflect or knit in with the say that the people have just had. Second, we need to do referendums differently. The public should be back in control of referendums. It's not enough to just say that everybody shall have a vote. That doesn't in itself guarantee meaningful public participation. There needs to be much more thought given to the public role from the very beginning of citizens' panels to help shape the terms of the debate of the referendum, the framework, the lenses through which we'll be seeing this important decision. There need to be proper resources, publicly funded open forums, and above all, uh, balanced facts, a fact book if you like, or a minimum data set that people could trust to be the basis of the, their conversations and deliberations. The second bit of doing referendums differently is about ground rules. We need a referendum rule book so that everybody knows where they are, the campaigns and the public. And we need tough enforcement measures so that when either campaign side makes a wildly misleading claim, it's called out at the time and tough enforcement action is taken. And we saw in the European Union vote both, that on both sides um, of the say and the leave, there were some vast claims made about how much it would cost uh, the public and the public purse and individual households on one side if the decision was to be made. And on the other side, there was the 350 million pounds that were going to the NHS. So both sides made wildly exaggerated claims. And we think that they should be an official body that could call those out during the campaign and take action. Finally, we want referendums to be far more deliberative. We want that time and that breathing space to be there so that by all means we should have 
high emotion in a discussion. Politics should be emotional, but there should also be the time and the breathing space as well for people to deliberate, to discuss, to debate among themselves. At their best, referendums can be an inspiration in public dialogue. They can actually give us a chance over, a, over the long term to become more democratic citizens, more involved in politics. But at their worst, they make us more divided. They make us more distrustful of each other's ability to make a good decision. I feel that in the UK, we are really guinea pigs. We're experimenting with referendums. But these are valuable experiments. In Ireland, where there was a referendum on gay marriage, the alternative vote referendum on the referendum on the voting system, which crashed and burned, this was in 2011, but as a rich source of learning about referendums and about how to achieve electoral reform in the future. And the referendum experience that we've just had in this country. So we do have a few more under our belts and we know so much more than we did. Now it's up to us all to make sure that future referendums are done better and done differently. Thank you very much. Thank you.